Morning everyone, welcome to the, today's edition of Trending Treasury. Um, just the usual bit of housekeeping, it looks like everyone is, but keeping microphones and cameras turned off. Um, I think we've still got a few people joining us, um, but we'll, we'll start the introductions and kick the session off. Today we're looking at multi-asset investing, particularly multi-asset income investing, um, and I'm joined by John Stockford, who's head of multi-asset income at 91, uh, previously Investec Asset Management. Some of you may be more familiar with that name. Um, John has been there, been there for many years. Um, how are you doing this morning, John? I'm good, thank you. How are things? Yes, not too bad. Um, are you planning any exciting activities for 21st of June yet? Uh, I'm actually starting to think about a holiday um, in in August. So yeah. Well, that's it. Um, I think there's probably a few people looking towards that. I'd imagine accommodation is in short supply. Um, and I don't don't know whether our Prime Minister had it in mind, but um, 21st of June is my birthday, so I'm hoping that... Oh, con congratulations. We... Apparently it's his birthday weekend as well, which is well, uh, a coincidence, <laughs> no doubt. There you go. Hopefully we, yeah, we'll start to be able to see a few more people. Um, so I think uh, as we're one minute past, we'll, we'll start to move into the, the session today looking at um, multi-asset investing and, and what that is and some perhaps some of the, the risks and touching on particularly on income which will be of interest to our clients um, those that are either invested with 91 or, or those that are perhaps considering it or other similar types of approaches um, so I mean to a certain extent um, part of it's in the name um, multi-asset investing um, looking to invest across different asset classes um, but perhaps you can start us off with um, talking about what your and 91's approach is to, to multi-asset investing uh, what it is you're, you're looking to achieve um, and, and why you see it as a, a beneficial approach so um, <clears throat> the strategy that we run, the um, Diversified Income Fund, um, it, it's essentially a, an outcome or a solutions um, based strategy. So we're trying to meet a particular client need and, and that need is defensive total return, def defensive income. Uh, and, and its genesis essentially was, um, you know, after the global financial crisis, yields on the safest assets collapsed. Uh, so central banks, Bank of England and others cut rates to the bone, uh, bond yields fell. Uh, and so we thought it would be increasingly hard for uh, clients to generate a defensive income from fixed income alone. And uh, was there a way essentially to broaden the opportunity set, look at a wider range of investments, including uh, some equities, including uh, listed property, um, but deliver similar um, risk characteristics, so bond-like volatility, limited drawdown, but generate a more consistent uh, higher return and, and income level. And, and so that's essentially what we set out to do and I think what we've, we've achieved over the last eight or nine years. And essentially we're doing three things. We're saying that actually the big opportunity in multi-asset isn't making heroic asset allocation calls it's actually security selection you've got a choice of something like 25,000 tradable listed securities from which you can build a portfolio so we think the first thing to do is look for the right types of, of securities and, and to, for us in, in addition to um, looking within bonds looking beyond that across the world for securities essentially with three characteristics a decent yield um, but not necessarily the highest yield because that often comes with additional risk. Um, a yield that's then underpinned by reliable or resilient cash flows on whatever asset um, is is driving that that investment. Um, so making sure that you know the money's there when it, it to pay the the dividends and and the coupons, and, and really to make sure that at times of stress that's an investment that's going to hold up relatively well, and then to look at other things that might support capital growth, so better value, um, good quality and so on. So we screen a very large universe for those, look for um, investments that might fit the bill and then do additional analysis. But then the, the um, other two things we're doing, the first is just making sure that when we put those securities together, 
the overall characteristics, the risk characteristics are bond-like, they're, they're low volatility. So making sure we're properly diversified um, and, and that we're not running too much risk in any one area. But also then we think one of the challenges these days in running a sort of defensive strategy or is really the risk of, of market drawdowns. You want to protect in times of market stress particularly um, because if you if you experience a drawdown on your your performance you then have to catch up to where you were if you can try and dampen any drawdowns but still catch upside you compound returns more consistently through time so so those are those are the three things um we're doing and income is the driver of that total return we think for a defensive fund just as with fixed income if you've got income as the sort of main driver of performance that's the thing you know the most about so resilient cash flows underpinning income is is really what we're trying to to deliver and, and aiming for a yield of around four percent yeah because i mean you talk there about you know trying to trying to avoid the extreme drawdowns or in you know, a negative movements in the fund um i mean obviously 2020 was a, a challenging year in markets um particularly as, as covid hit um did you see the the strategy performing in the way that you would have expected or would have liked during during 2020 and those particular events of market stress yeah i mean i i think broadly yes so we delivered a positive return for the the eighth year in a row uh, we did have a drawdown during sort of february and march but we made that up essentially by um uh, the middle of the year um and in terms of you know what was going on in markets actually some of the safest parts of the market were proportionately the hardest hit so you know investment grade corporate bonds um you know triple a rated names like johnson and johnson took a real pounding in in march simply because investors were sort of scrambling for liquidity um, but actually that was an opportunity to add positions there because those positions were essentially in our view money good and and um, you know we we could benefit from the recovery which is what we did in in the, through the middle and the second half of the year so yeah I think we we reduced risk pretty dramatically during February and uh, March it reduced exposure and that helped um, and then we benefited from the recovery in markets that we've seen uh, post March into the beginning of this year. Okay, okay, yeah, and I suppose looking at talking about about risks, um, risk. do you have a a view on what the major risks are, perhaps for the the year ahead? Um, obviously, a lot of uncertainty at the moment, um, but you know we've we've brought up a slide slide here. I mean, there's a lot of talk at the moment about rising inflation, um, and we we have seen some. Government bond yields, developed market government bond yields starting to to rise as well. Um, I mean, what are you seeing as the, I suppose the the major risks as we go forward into 2021? So, to to our minds, that you know, it's a really challenging environment for sort of pure fixed income investors. Uh, and on the left, you've got one of the reasons for that, in that you've got um, yields on government bonds and cash rates basically cut to the bone. So um, central banks are trying to reflate the global economy and to do so they promised essentially to keep rates uh, close to zero for the indefinite future and also to sort of intervene in the bond market via uh, QE and that's suppressed yield. So you're not getting much yield from owning those things but then the risk is at some point yields rise and you get capital losses uh, and clearly what they're trying to achieve is a more persistently higher level, persistent higher level of inflation. So some of the things on the right hand side are looking at more stru structural factors that uh, lie behind inflation. And we think that on balance, a lot of those are becoming you know, less disinflationary, more inflationary. So the risk is inflation, you know, central banks succeed. Um, there's also cyclical reasons why inflation might pick up, you know, high, higher commodity prices, uh, a return to growth um, leading to demand exceeding supply for a while. So you've talked about people going on holiday. If everyone wants to go on holiday at the same time and there aren't enough places to go, then prices get pushed up. So there are, there are cyclical and structural reasons that might, and clearly fiscal policy is part of that as well. So government's borrowing a lot, 
um, the risk is that they succeed and so yields rise and so you get capital losses on uh, on on bond strategies so we think the opportunity is actually to be pretty cautious about interest rate risk so duration as it's it's typically known um, and to focus more on where there's uh, potentially upside while still managing downside risk so upside we think are in places like for example dividends on high quality um, resilient equities where you know dividends were um, constrained by the sort of drop in in economic activity over covid as that rebounds as we sort of vaccinate the population and, and move on um, you know there's huge upside potentially for dividends to to recover and grow um, similarly we think you know in selective markets you there are interesting yields but you have to pick individual securities not um, go out and just buy broad brush uh, government bonds for example where a lot of those markets are going to lose you money yeah could you i mean perhaps touching on that point um are you able to give uh, an example of somewhere that, or an investment that you you're holding that looks particularly interesting um to sort of give a bit of flavor of the assets that you think actually a bit more attractive than just going out and, and holding a broad brush of government bonds yeah so for example if you picked a single government issuer um uh, and so we own for example some uh, bonds issued by the New Zealand local government funding agency so that's an agency of the New Zealand government that essentially raises money for the kinds of clients that, that you have on on this call so uh, local authorities in New Zealand but rather than them borrowing individually they're borrowing collectively um, and so they're all jointly liable for each other and those bonds have the first claim on all tax revenues in those those uh, municipalities. So, you know, if, if um, people pay their business rates or their, their property taxes in, in Auckland, that money first has to go to pay the bondholders before the council can spend any money on roads or education or, or anything else. So we think it's probably one of the strongest credits out there. New Zealand's a pretty sound economy overall. You earn over 3% at the moment on long dated bonds there, and you can hedge those back to sterling at virtually no cost. And so you're ending up essentially with a government bond in, in um, sterling yielding about 3%, which in the context that, you know, longer dated gilts yield probably closer to 1%, you know, shows you that there are opportunities if you're prepared to go and look for them. Yes, I mean, the, the clients on the call will probably be familiar with um, similar similar approaches um, that are being attempted by the municipal bonds agency in the UK for, for local authorities. No sort of shared bonds actually being issued by them yet. Um, but perhaps perhaps going forward, if that does happen, it might be something that that enters onto your radar. Although it, again, perhaps those um, <laughs> perhaps the rates on there won't be quite as in, interesting yeah. for the yields that you guys are, are looking at. Um, one thing that's worth touching before we, we perhaps move on into other areas touching on is, you know, you're looking across, I suppose broadly across bonds and, and equities as well as some other areas. Um, but of course, the, the correlations between particularly bonds and equities have, have risen in recent times compared to perhaps historically, you know, the view of just being able to, to have a, a broadly balanced portfolio of equities and bonds. Um, I mean, how do you go, how do you approach the fact, you know, you're trying to achieve um, a volatility lower than equity markets, um, but what's your approach in bearing in mind that some of those equities you might be holding could be fairly correlated with with bonds as well? Yeah, so, so first I'll clarify, we're, we're looking to deliver what we call a bond-like level of volatility, so well below the level of equities. We, we cap ourselves at less than half volatility of equity and typically run a portfolio with volatility of somewhere between sort of 20 to 40 percent of equity market risk which is very similar as i'll show you in a, in a minute to the kind of volatility that you get in in um, sort of traditional fixed income um, in terms of how we control that you're exactly right i mean one of the big challenges for investors is you know things that people have assumed are defensive like government bonds may turn out to be correlated to other positions in the portfolio and rather than dampening volatility they can contribute to volatility so 
we're, as I said, pretty cautious about using uh, interest rate risk or duration or bonds to manage volatility and are using other things. So um, probably the, the, the primary thing we're doing is making sure that we own things that are cheap and attractive because I think typically their defensive qualities tend to be better and also resilient in terms of uh, cash flows, as we said. But we're also hedging uh, quite a lot of the risk and making sure that we don't have um, much overall exposure to things like equity. So our net equity exposure at the moment is fairly low. It's about um, 16 or so percent of the overall portfolio. So the vast majority of the portfolio is in what we think are attractively valued uh, fixed income uh, positions. Um, but we can also vary that amount of, of equity exposure. We've been as low as basically zero, and we've probably been as high as about 25% or so. And, and clearly, in times of market stress, we're going to, to veer more towards, towards the lower end of that. And I think a lot of fixed income assets, which traditionally you might regard as less risky than equity, potentially at the moment look pretty uh, unattractive. So for example, high yield corporate bonds, um, they're high yield because they're basically poor quality companies um, and they offer currently the lowest yields that they've probably ever offered investors. So they're not giving you much compensation for risk. Whereas good quality, more defensive equities might be yielding um, at least as much, if not more, and have the scope for dividends to grow over time and for earnings to rise, particularly in uh, a recovery after the sort of COVID crisis. So it's about trying to strike the right balance, but overall make sure that volatility is low. And you can see on this chart, over time, we've had an annualized volatility of around 5%. So we're the diamonds uh, towards the, the top left. Uh, and that's where you want to be. You want to be on the left-hand side of the graph because that's lower risk, but you also want to be up uh, the left-hand scale because that's yield. So we're trying to capture the best trade-off we can between income and ultimately total return and volatility. And, and, and so far we've done that, I think, quite well. So we've got a similar level of yield to a lot of the sort of more high yielding parts of the market like high yield debt, emerging market debt, equity, but we're delivering it with the kind of volatility that you typically associate with government bonds and high quality corporate bonds. Yeah, I think it's it's that approach, actually not, not just of your strategy across other multi-asset income strategies, which is attractive to investors um, and, and to our clients on the line as well, um, you know, trying trying to have, I suppose, a, the best of both worlds in terms of uh, not having too much risk, but getting a, a relatively decent return. Um, now, the focus certainly for, for our clients is on income, um, and you know, this is a diversified income fund. Um, now, obviously noting that, as you've touched on, 2020 was, uh, depending on what parts of the market you're invested in, a pretty tough year in terms of income levels um, with particularly with dividends being cut, et cetera. Obviously, interest rates being, policy rates being cut as well. Um, now, so noting that on a dividend pence per share basis, um, that we have seen funds having some impact um, of, of, well, achieving lower income during 2020 compared to the calendar year 2019. Um, I think on multi-asset and the diversified income fund, perhaps 9% or so down, um, which actually when, probably when we're sitting here in, in March, we might have been thinking it could have been much worse for some strategies. Um, so not too bad an outcome, but what's your view of the year ahead? Um, are you expecting to be able to, to grow the distribution from the fund again as economies start to reopen? Um, are, you, are you still pretty cautious about that? What's your general views? Okay, so I mean, for us, we are focused exclusively on our three objectives. So our three objectives are delivering an attractive but resilient yield. So we don't want to chase too high a yield. We want one that essentially reflects what we think is available in, in the market. Um, to deliver then a, a sort of similar overall level of total return. So essentially to protect capital as much as possible. Um, and then in addition to deliver that with what we call bond-like volatility. So we, we are focused exclusively. We're not trying to beat markets. We're not trying to you know, generate heroic returns. We're trying to 
find the best trade-off between those three objectives and, and try and do that as consistently as uh, as possible. So the focus is on resilience of, of income. So we think we're helped in that by um, picking individual security. So rather than allocating to asset classes where you get the good and the bad all lumped together, we're going out and looking for individual securities that have that mix of a decent yield, but one that's resilient and underpinned by good cash flow and you know is is, is attractively um, valued. Um, Ultimately, clearly, you know, the, the overall level of yields in markets have, has come down. So we think an attractive and resilient income these days is around 4%, you know, 35 to 4.5%. It might have been more like 4 and a bit percent previously. So, and that just reflects reality. If you, if you try and reach for something more than that, you're going to take too much risk. And this is about delivering a defensive income and a defensive total return, not not about, you know, chasing yield for yield's sake and ending up losing clients lots of money in, in times of of market stress. So around four percent, I think, is achievable, but it is achievable um, by being selective, by going out and looking for where those opportunities are. And we think in a universe of twenty five thousand or whatever securities, you're always going to find some uh that that have those characteristics and and within that i think you know as i said there are some opportunities selectively within government or government related entities like the new zealand local government funding agency i mentioned there are the same within the corporate bond market uh, there are some parts within sort of the emerging world which we think are underappreciated and pretty safe particularly when hedged back to uh to sterling so avoiding any currency risk um and then equity and property as well in limited uh, size there I think you know you have clearly got upside in a lot of areas even within relatively defensive uh, businesses um, for 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 you know dividends to rise because you know they have been constrained by um, economic uh, shutdowns in COVID and as those get eased their business is going to pick up and their ability to generate um, revenues and profits and, and ultimately generate cash to pay dividends uh, um, it, it is there. We actually, I think, held up pretty well last year in terms of, of income. It didn't come off very much. Uh, you know, it, it, as with all income, it came down a bit. Um, but because we were focused on resilience, we weren't hit by lots of companies that cut their dividends. Where our dividends basically held up, they just didn't go up very much. Um, and elsewhere, you know, income on fixed income over time, the yield has been coming down. So I think around 4% is the kind of level for now we think is achievable. Who knows in the future? I mean, I think it, it could sort of go either way. If the, the world remains stagflationary, disinflationary, you know, secular stagnation, ultimately 4% might be hard to achieve over the longer term. But if central banks are successful and manage to reflate, then yields over time should rise again. Uh, our sense is probably, you know, four percent or just below is likely to be as low as as yields uh, go for the time being, and ultimately they might go up a bit. Thanks for that. Um, so yeah, certainly have uh, clients who uh, are focused on that yield at that. That income. Um, so good to hear some comments that you think around the four percent level, which is uh, an attractive level, um, is is still achievable. Um, so I mean, just conscious uh, of time now, um, perhaps start to start to wrap up. But I just wanted to touch on. Um, you talked about stock selection. Just wanted to touch on ESG um, and right. the ESG integration approach um, that I know you take, um, because. I think these days it's it's something that every investor is now thinking about more and more. Um, so perhaps just a, a comment as part of that stock selection process, looking at you know whether individual securities meet your requirements. Um, how does ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors? How does that come into the mix? So I mean, as a business, we believe very um, profoundly. I think in in um, w wanting to invest responsibly and and we also recognize that ultimately we are custodians of other people's money and we need to make sure that we look after that and we deliver um on the, the sort of uh 
um, objectives that we we've been set and, and ESG I think is a very important part of that so you know we think we're in a world where um, it can't be business as usual for a lot of, of traditional businesses that um, markets increasingly and investors and clients are going to pay attention to the so-called negative externalities the things beyond normal business which can impact um, the future of, of, of businesses and also um, the, the, their their value. So uh, importantly, as an investor, that you know that's clearly uh, one of the, the sort of key things it, it will come down to. So, for example, we have divested within our fund from tobacco. Um, you know, uh, tobacco companies still generate lots of cash. People smoke um, some of them, uh, vape, uh, uh, and so on. But our concern is that the negative externalities that the sort of health risks and the regulatory risks that come from that are very hard for those companies to uh, address and, and mitigate. Um, even if they move to sort of next generation products, you know, they're, they're really sort of rather untested and they're just a, a derivative of the same problem. Uh, and so it's very hard, I think, to price those kind of assets, particularly over the medium term correctly um, and to price in all the risks. Uh, and for valuations to reflect that appropriately. And, and so, you know, our, our decision was there are better opportunities with a sort of clearer path and clearer transitions uh, that we can look at. So, so we took that decision over uh, a year or two uh, and, and now hold no tobacco exposure either within fixed income or in equity, for example. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I know that the you recently published a ESG report looking at the diversified income fund specifically, I think, which is is good to see um, sort of going beyond the ESG at just at the, the company level. Um, and that includes things like trying to estimate the, the carbon footprint of the portfolio. Um, I mean, clearly these things are emerging areas uh, and perhaps difficult to do in terms of data provision, etc. Um, but I mean, does do those sorts of things influence your decision in, in particularly around climate change? I um, mean, how much uh, uh, influence does uh, that have on the stock selection itself? Absolutely. So we we have been um, building as a, a team and a, as a business, um, you know, tools to try and help us understand the carbon footprint of uh, the businesses and entities that we invest in. Uh, and it, it's not just their direct carbon um, uh, use and uh, emissions, so the sort of scope one and two emissions at scope three, it's their impact more broadly down down the value chain in uh, you know um, uh, in terms of carbon intensity and and you know as you say the data I think is is partial. So one of the big challenges for all investors I think is to try and you know over time improve their understanding. But it's also then about identifying you know what are potential problems in. Uh, the portfolio and how to mitigate that, how to uh, advocate, how to uh, address it, whether to divest uh, and so on. So, I, I, you know, as a business, this is a huge commitment for us. We believe very passionately in it. I think decarbonisation and, and, and the environmental side is probably the one that's front and centre simply because, you know, if we don't change the way we live over time as a society, we may not have a society. Um, but at the same time, all the you know the other um, environmental, social, and, and governance issues, you know, clearly um, need to be factored in as well. So you know, th there's a huge amount of work that goes into this, and every single security we look at, this is one of the key areas that we we think about before we decide is this something we should invest in, uh, and, and is it something that that ultimately can uh, help us build um, a, a a good defensive income strategy for our clients. Okay, good. Well, obviously ESG is a, a topic that could have its own um, endless uh, discussions around, so we'll we'll perhaps leave that there um, and I think probably wrap up there really. Um, and haven't seen any questions come through um, on the chat, but if, if anyone does have any questions, if they want to let us know now, um, just a quick advert for next week. Obviously we have the, the budget on Wednesday so we'll have a session looking at the impact of the budget and reactions to that next week with uh, Wellington Asset Management so join us for that one. Um, but as I haven't seen any questions come through um, just want to thank you for joining us John.
um, for thanks, a, Greg, and in, thanks to all the uh, attendees as well. Yes, indeed. Um, and if anyone has any questions, oh, quick question coming through. Um, obviously, we can we can follow up with John if anyone on the line has thinks of a question afterwards. Um, just waiting. A couple of questions coming through from from my colleagues actually. Um, on the New Zealand municipal bonds, um, question is that if the risks are low and the returns are, are so good, why aren't more doing it? Uh, I, I think some people are, um, I, and it's not something you're going to have a you know 100% of the portfolio in. It's a, it's a relatively small uh, position. I think across two uh, um, New Zealand local government funding agency bonds, we probably have uh, about bit over two percent of of the portfolio um i mean the, probably the biggest risk uh, at the margin is liquidity um, but it's a long-term position as far as we're concerned so we're not going to be trading in and out uh, very much it's it's a bit less liquid than the government and new zealand government bonds are a bit less liquid than than gilts because it's a much smaller economy so there's not there's not as much of it about but i think there's enough to include a portion uh, in the portfolio, but you know, it reflects the fact that there's a higher um, interest rate expectation in the medium term in New Zealand. Whether that's right or wrong doesn't really matter in the short term, because in 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 the short term, New Zealand are committed to low rates, so you're earning positive carry and uh, uh, um, pick up in in yield there. And we think the market's priced too aggressively for for higher yields, and and so we're happy to capture that. And you know, the additional yield on the local government bonds. We think is 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 fantastic given the quality of them. Yeah, and, and touching on on yields, um, final question here is: UK yields are rising. Um, you know, we've we've seen gilt yields, particularly over the last few weeks, rise. Um, do you have a view on how sustained you think that move will be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, you know yields aren't going to go high quickly i don't think i mean they've already risen a, a fair amount globally and they cannot maybe do the same again they can sort of you know uh, yields could double from here which sounds like a dramatic move but um you know relative to where they are it's not it's not massive simply because you know at this point in the cycle the risk to, uh, to the upside ultimately in terms of inflation interest rates and there's a lot of borrowing going on so you know governments are are are, are issuing lots of debt um so nominal growth is going to pick up borrowing is high uh, and ultimately you know the next move in interest rates at the moment is likely to be up but some some way away the reason they're not going to run away quickly is typically inflation takes time to build persistently and also the, the policy response at the moment is is pretty clear that um, central banks want inflation to pick up a bit and so they're going to keep policy locked down at the short end of, of yield curves uh, for the time being. So I, I think this is more of a gradual trend rise potentially in yields rather than just um, you know uh, rapid one-way traffic in the near term. Okay fantastic. Uh, so I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, we've gone over the half hour mark so obviously yeah any follow-up questions um, we can certainly direct those towards John. Um, and yeah thanks for everyone for joining us and hope you all have a good day. Thanks thanks Greg. Bye-bye. Cheers John.